the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference, Realities for a New Reality. Two days, 25 workshops, renowned speakers and presenters, by families, for families, nearly 40 hours of unfiltered and straightforward information made possible by the leaders in disability rights advocacy for over 45 years, Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher, Attorneys at Law. So welcome to this session of our ongoing Encore presentation series of the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending the Hinkle, Pryor, and Fisher Virtual Parent Empowerment Conference. My name is Christina Tosti, and I will be your moderator this workshop entitled Guardianship, Optimizing Protection While Maximizing Independence. Our presenters for this session are Tina James and Jared Overweiss. Before we begin, we ask all participants to remain muted throughout the session. This workshop will last approximately 90 minutes, and if time allows, the presenters will take questions either intermittently or at the end. Please ask your questions through the chat feature in the control bar, and I will ask as many of them as I can, again, if time permitting. For Friday, if you've not already done so, I highly encourage you to sign up for this evening's keynote address, delivered by former New Jersey Supreme Court Justice Helen E. Hones, entitled Autism After COVID-19, Navigating a World Where Everything Changed and Nothing Changed. Justice Hones is also the parent of an adult child with autism and will provide a unique perspective on the times in which we live. She's both an inspiring person and inspirational speaker. You don't want to miss out. Simply register. It is now my pleasure to welcome our speakers. Tina James is an experienced advocate and litigator. Her legal work focuses on estate planning and administration, guardianship, and assisting individuals with disabilities access appropriate services. Before working as a litigator with the national law firm, she served as a judicial law clerk in the New Jersey Superior Court Appellate Division. She has successfully argued before the Florida Supreme Court, as well as other state and federal courts. Tina was selected for inclusion in the Super Lawyers Rising Stars in 2015 and 2016. Tina received her Juris Doctorate from Rutgers University School of Law and her undergraduate degree from Rutgers University Douglas College. Personally and professionally, Tina is committed to promoting all aspects of diversity and inclusion. She volunteers with a variety of nonprofit organizations serving children and is a past member of the Board of Directors for the Florida Diversity Council. Tina lives in Central Jersey with her husband, Andrew, her two stepchildren, and their daughter. Jared Oberweiss concentrates his practice in estate and trust matters, guardianship, and adult services. Jared enjoys uh, ensuring the rights of individuals with disabilities are protected. He writes and speaks on topics concerning the rights of individuals with disabilities and their families. Jared was admitted to New Jersey Bar and Pennsylvania Bar in 2014 after receiving his jurisdiction doctorate from Duquesne School of Law. At Duquesne University School of Law, Jared served on Duquesne Law Review as a senior staff editor. Prior to law school, he obtained a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Pittsburgh, graduating cum laude. Jared volunteers not only on the board of directors of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, a nonprofit organization that advocates and empowers individuals and their families affected by mental illness, but also um, provide pro bono services to the local community. Jared is currently a member of uh, Mercer County Bar Association. Jared and his family actively support Special Olympics of New Jersey. Outside of work, Jared enjoys golfing, cooking, and traveling. He currently lives in Yardville, New Jersey with his fiance, Lissa, and their dog, Bex. And without further ado, take it away, guys. All right, well, thank you very much, Christina. And we look forward to presenting uh, for you guys today. So today's presentation, as you're well aware, is on guardianship. So uh, let's first start with what is guardianship and why is it necessary, especially if you didn't uh, happen to catch the earlier presentation by Ellen Nalvin. Um, so let's get started. When someone reaches the age of majority, and in New Jersey that's 18 years old, they are now deemed an adult and under the eyes of the law, they're now solely responsible for making all decisions 
regardless of whether they have an intellectual or developmental disability. So what does this mean for you as a parent? Well, it means that when your child turns 18, you as the parent no longer have any natural rights, all right? So you're no longer the natural guardian. That means that you no longer have the ability to make uh, decisions for your loved one or to gain information on his or her behalf. So guardianships can only be established by a court of law. And in order to establish a guardianship, a court has to declare the individual who we call a ward as incapacitated and appoints an individual or an entity as a guardian to make decisions on that individual's behalf. Now the legal standard for guardianship for an incapacitated person is whether or not the individual is unfit and unable to manage and govern his or her own affairs. And I'm just gonna repeat that legal standard for you. So the standard for guardianship is whether the individual is unfit and unable to manage and govern his or her own affairs. Now, generally speaking, you can't petition the court for guardianship until the individual turns 18. However, you can apply for guardianship any time after the age of 18. There is no age cutoff. So let's say that, you know, as someone gets older, there is an onset dementia or there is an intellectual or developmental disability. It, just because you haven't sought guardianship around the age of 18 doesn't mean that you can't seek guardianship down the road. So with that, I'm going to turn that over to Tina to tell you a little bit more about guardianship. And Jared had mentioned that, that legal standard for us, they can't manage their own affairs. And guardianship is broken down into a couple different types of guardianship. And that's, uh, it, it surrounds the standard of managing one's own affairs. So there's two types of guardianship. Number one, the guardian of the person. And that means the guardian makes legal and med uh, medical decisions um, for that person. The guardianship of the, the property, the guardian is making financial decisions for the person. So you often hear times somebody say, I'm the guardian of the person and the property. More often than not, you are the guardian of both because more often than not, the person needs it. But there are circumstances where they don't need a guardian for all areas of their life. But just briefly, so you understand when we're talking about legal, medical, and financial decisions, we're talking about like medical decisions, we're talking about the ability for someone to maybe indicate when he or she is not well, uh, be able to describe the symptoms, uh, what's happening to them, but also do they understand how their human body works? Are they able to assess risks of a medical procedure, maybe take medication for themselves? And if they can't, that's usually when a guardian uh, needs to, to step in uh, to help them with that. Same thing with um, financial decisions. You know, Do they understand, can they recognize currency and if they're going shopping, do they understand if they're being charged the right amount for something or maybe if they're getting the right change back when making a, pur a purchase? So when we're talking about legal, medical, financial decisions, those are the type of things that we're looking for with the guardianship. There's also two levels of guardianship, so to speak. And, and I, I kind of alluded to that as well. There's the full guardianship. It's called plenary guardianship. And that encompasses all decision making for a person. We also have a limited guardianship. And this is where... The individual with disabilities can still retain uh, some of the decision making. Maybe they are able to make medical decisions on their own behalf, uh, but they need a guardian for other decisions. Uh, but you also know, in a, a limited guardianship, um, you know, there's also decisions regarding residential decision making, like where they want to live, educational decision, vocational decisions. And even with the guardianship in place, uh, the person under guardianship still is able to uh, express their preferences regarding these different areas. So it's important to keep that in mind. And uh, I'm going to turn it over for Jared to talk with us about some alternatives to the guardianship, because guardianship is a very extreme remedy where a court is removing somebody's rights and putting another person in place to step in. Um, so we're going to look at some of the other alternatives to that. So with everything that's just been told to you, not everyone, keep in mind, necessarily needs a guardian. Right, so what are some alternatives to guardianship and other protective measures that can be used or utilized in order to care for and advocate on behalf of another? You know, so the first would be really be a conservatorship, all right? And a conservatorship is a voluntary arrangement which is um, instituted by someone who is competent, which is important, and that person is the conservatee. And that person grants someone else the authority to manage his or her property. And the person to whom the conservatee is granting the authority is a conservator. In order to establish a conservatorship, a court proceeding is necessary, and it cannot be done if the conservatee objects. So again, this is a voluntary proceeding. 
Since it is voluntary, the conservatee can revoke the conservatorship at any point in time. Now, again, provided that the conservatee is competent at the time that he or she wishes to revoke uh, the conservatorship. This type of arrangement is, is useful when the conservatee has limited abilities to manage his or her own financial matters, and they're acceptable with a conservator that they have um, or they're will, wishing to appoint in doing so. All right, and an, an example of when um, you know, a conservatorship may be sought is you know, when there's persons with cognitive impairments or mental illness or any other disabilities or afflictions who really have difficulties um, properly managing their financial affairs. Now, with that said, it, it is much more common, at least in our line of work, and you know, for our clients to seek a limited guardianship of the estate rather than a conservatorship. And this really is because oftentimes the individual over whom uh, you're seeking guardianship over, again, the ward, that person does not have the requisite mental capacity, which has led us to pursuing the guardianship matter. And that capacity requirement is also a requirement uh, for conservatorship. So another tool is powers of attorney, right? So we have a financial power of attorney where an attorney, in fact, makes financial decisions on behalf of the principal principal being the person whose documents they've created and the, uh, the, the principal is the one who appoints the attorney in fact. And we also have a medical directive or a healthcare power of attorney or a living will or a healthcare proxy. And lots of different names for this. Similar to the financial power of attorney, this is uh, where the attorney in fact makes healthcare related decisions for the principal, right? So one is financial, one is healthcare related decisions. Unlike the guardianship, there is no court involvement in the drafting and executing of powers of attorney. But keep in mind that the person signing these documents, that's the principal, they must have the requisite mental capacity to understand the documents that they're signing in order to make them legally effective. Similar to the conservatorship though, they can also be revoked at any point in time. Again, assuming that uh, the principal has the capacity at that time if they wish to revoke those documents. Guardianship, on the other hand, can only be transferred or terminated by a court. So we have a little bit of a catch-22 here, you know, especially when, you know, we meet with clients and clients say, well, you know, we're thinking of one or we're thinking of the other. You know, the guardianship route says that the child specifically lacks capacity or, excuse me, the young adult, whereas the power of attorney is saying that the young adult specifically does have the capacity. So how do you reconcile this? You know, oftentimes the best place to start is really to reach out to um, the young adult's doctor or doctors and see what his or her thoughts are as far as if you were to move forward with the guardianship route, would they be on board? You know, would they be willing to sign a certification? You know, saying that within their medical um, expertise, they believe that this is necessary. Another tool that we use uh, sometimes is a psychiatric advanced directive. So under our firm's you know, medical directive, or again, the healthcare power of attorney, the healthcare document, we can include a psychiatric advance directive. This document or this, uh, these provisions, if you will, um, essentially reflect someone's wishes as far as psychiatric treatment or care, which is made during a period of wellness. And this can, in fact, be relied upon um, in a time of crisis. It also can provide informed consent for treatments which the principal has predetermined. And it also can provide valuable health and medical information to doctors and hospitals. So another tool is also, you know, with, when we're talking about social security benefits, you know, there's a representative payee that's appointed on behalf of the individual. And a representative payee is an individual or entity um, who's appointed by the Social Security Administration to manage a beneficiary's payment of, you know, supplemental security income, SSI, or perhaps social security disability insurance benefits, SSDI. The representative pay is only responsible for and is only allowed to manage this specific type of payment and property. And Social Security can also change the representative pay if they feel that the current representative pay is insufficiently managing the funds for the beneficiary. It would also uh, be wise to talk about you know, special needs trusts and a trustee who manages those funds, right? So a trustee is an individual or an entity who's named by the settler. The settler is a person who creates the document to manage the assets within the trust for the specific beneficiary. Similar to what I just said about a representative payee, a trustee is only responsible for and is only allowed to manage the assets within the special needs trust. And the trustee must manage the trust property according to the terms of the document itself. Now, if you didn't catch Tina's earlier, uh, earlier presentation, I also just wanna quickly talk 
talk about an ABLE account, um, ABLE standing for Achieving a Better Life Experience, and the person who manages this type of account is an authorized representative. And this is a little bit of a newer topic, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit more information about this than say perhaps the trust, as you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar or have heard about the special needs trust. But in order to establish an ABLE account, you have to demonstrate that the individual has a significant disability which manifested itself before the age of 26. Now, if the individual is receiving SSI or SSDI and they meet that age criteria as far as when the disability um, has onset, the individual is gonna qualify, all right? Keep in mind that funds within an ABLE account do not affect Medicaid eligibility. You can have up to $100,000 in an ABLE account without it affecting SSI, Supplemental Security Income, um, at least the, the full benefit. You can also contribute a maximum um, in total, whether it's from a handful of people or one person at all, there's a maximum contribution into the account of $15,000 per year. And that runs in line with the federal gift tax exclusion. So if that number goes up, the maximum contribution for the ABLE account should as well. I caution clients on using um, an ABLE account solely as a savings mechanism because any funds that remain in the account at the time that the individual passes is going to first go up to paying back any governmental liens. Medicaid, potentially DDD, and this will oftentimes exhaust the entire remaining balance. So what can you use funds from an ABLE account for? Well, if you're familiar with a special needs trust where you really can't spend those funds on food, shelter, or clothing, a major difference to the ABLE account is that you can specifically use the funds for housing, all right? So that's um, something that, that's in contrast to a special needs trust. They can also be used for education, transportation, you know, employment training, assistive technology, um, financial management services, legal fees, administration, uh, able, uh, administration expenses for an ABLE account, funeral and burial, basic living expenses. So I just want you to remember that a representative payee, a trustee of a special needs trust, and an authorized representative on behalf of an ABLE account, they're limited to managing specific types of assets, whereas a conservator or a guardian of property is responsible for managing all other assets other than those managed by the representative payee, the trustee, or the authorized representative. So what does the guardianship process look like? Tina, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit more about that? Sure, uh, so you know, you've talked to your you know, child's physician or you know, maybe a family physician about what the best process is, and now you're gonna move forward uh, with the guardianship process. So if your son or daughter is transitioning to adulthood, turning 18, and you're looking to put the guardianship in place as close to when they're turning 18, you wanna start that process approximately six months before their birthday. Uh, because we can't file it until their birthday, but that gives us enough time to get all the documents ready. Um, and we'll talk about what that involves. We'll talk about the doctor's um, evaluations that are needed. So it'll give us a chance to get all that ready so that by their 18th birthday, we have all of the paperwork back, everything ready to go, and it can be filed. If the person's already 18, then you, know, you can start that process at any time you, you need to. And so the first thing you do is you, you, know, you meet with the attorney. We do a pretty comprehensive intake, and we ask you a whole bunch of questions about uh, your son or daughter so that way we can prepare information for the court. We are going to put together a complaint, and the purpose of this complaint, and it's very difficult for families, but it's to tell the court what they can't do so that way we can explain to them why the guardian is needed. And like I said, this is very difficult for, for parents to go through this because they're often thinking about the things their children can do or how, how far they've come and how much they've progressed. But it's very important uh, for areas that they're not able to um, handle their own affairs, manage their, manage their own affairs, uh, that we tell that to the court because that's what the court is going to use to make a decision as to whether or not they're going to put a guardian in place. And so things that we're, we're going to ask about are, you know, like I said, their capabilities. We're also going to talk about their schooling. You know, what are they doing in school? What type of classes are they in? Are they in a, in a self-contained class? Are they in a, a special school? Um, what are their daily activities like? Um, and then we're going to take down the information about the proposed guardian. The other piece of doing the guardianship uh, intake and getting the process going is uh, getting the uh, finding out what assets the person with disability might have. So if they have assets, we have to let the court know because 
again, we'll be asking the court to appoint a, you know, a guardian of most likely the person and the property. Um, but also at that time, if they are turning 18 and, and you're preparing to apply for government benefits, you're going to want to think about how those assets are going to impact those government benefits. So again, you know, at that point, it's, it's a good way to, to, to check in and say, okay, I'm going to be making this application uh, to apply for SSI, Medicaid, because down the road, we, we need DDD services. And, you know, they have over $2,000 in savings bonds that they've accumulated during their lifetime. So not only do we need to tell the court that, but it also helps, again, we can plan this transition, not only just for the guardianship piece, but also what to do to make sure that they're set up to get uh, any services and supports that, that, are, that they need. So we go through this, this intake process. We, you prepare the, the asset sheet for us. We, we draft all this document. The other piece we need to file the application with the court is two certifications from doctors. And so we do the intake, we take the information down regarding the physicians, um, we prepare all of that document, all the documents for you, and then you would take those physician certifications to your doctors so your son or daughter can have an evaluation. Now, this is a form that doctors are very familiar with. They fill hundreds of them out. So it's, it's not gonna be something new or, or difficult or different for them. Um, in that regard. But the key is that when we are filing the application with the court, we need to make sure that the evaluations, when the doctors saw your son or daughter, is within a 30-day window. And this is a very, very important deadline. And that's why like the six-month planning helps us start to get the paperwork you know, drafted on our end, get that ball rolling, but also then you can set up those doctor's appointments. So if you know your child is turning 18 on January 10th, you can go ahead and get the doctor's appointments ready to go at the end of December. So they're evaluated. We have those forms back. January 10th comes along. Here we go. Let's go ahead and file everything with the court. Once we file it with the court, um, every county is uh, slightly different, but um, one thing that remains the same is that there will be what's called a court appointed attorney appointed for the individual with a disability. So we represent the parents. Um, we're filing this application on behalf of the parents, but the court wants to make sure that there's someone uh, checking out, looking after the interests of uh, your son or daughter. So they're going to appoint uh, a court appointed attorney and that person is going to contact the family and do some general interviews. They will uh, interview the, the person who you're applying for to have a guardianship of. They'll also interview family members, usually just immediate family members, those that live in the house. Um, and then if there's adult uh, siblings that might live outside of the house, they'll interview them as well. The court appointed attorney will go ahead and put a report together and they will file that with the court. And generally speaking, that report talks about S similar things to what we've provided in the complaint, but it'll also tell the court, hey, this is a family. I met with them. They are, they are great. They're loving. They've been caring for their son or daughter their entire life, and they are the two best people to continue doing so, and they're willing and able to, and that's why they should be the guardian, right? And so that's very important. A lot of times people are, are worried about the court-appointed attorney, but, you know, they're coming in to make sure that the, the person who needs the guardian has the best person and more often than not that's the family members who have been caring for them their entire life so they file that report and then like i said some things vary based on each county um, and each judge most of the time the the court will re receive it all the paperwork and they will go ahead and just enter the guardianship set a date review everything enter the guardianship order and then we will receive uh, a copy of the final order other times, the court will set it for a hearing. Now, that doesn't mean anything's wrong with the paperwork. It just means that that's how that particular judge chooses to handle their docket and their cases, and they prefer to have a hearing uh, to hear directly from the parties instead of just reading it all on the, on the papers as well. So once the order is entered, then the guardians would have to, what they call, qualify. So basically, uh, you're signing, taking an oath that you're going to uh, go ahead and serve in that role and you would be issued uh, guardianship papers and that's what you would show and use as you need to make decisions for uh, the person that uh, has the disability. So Jared, I think is gonna touch on some of the guardianship issues right now in light of COVID-19 because that's thrown a wrench in how we're doing everything these days. 
It, it certainly has. I mean, times right now are quite different than they were go seven or eight months back. Um, so how does that impact guardianships in general? Um, well, as far as I'm aware, at least as, as far as uncontested guardianships go, all uncontested guardianships are being conducted either on the papers, as Tina had mentioned, either by phone or by video conferencing, such as Zoom. They are not having in-court uh, appearances, at least not as of today. Also, um, and, and these rules are, I guess, there's, these rules have been relaxed, at least as far as with COVID-19. They're trying to relax the rules to make it uh, more accessible to the court system to complete guardianship, especially when it's necessary because just because there's a health crisis going on doesn't change the fact that, you know, your child may have now turned 18 and you don't have the ability to advocate um, on behalf of him or her. So in addition to hearings, um, in addition to no in-person uh, court appearances, physicians, um, as Tina had mentioned before, where we need those doctor certifications, they can examine the child um, by phone or by video to complete their certification. Typically, they're supposed to have an in-person examination, but as of today, and again, we have no idea when they're going to pull back these relaxed rules, but as of today, this type of examination can be done remotely. Similarly, when the court-appointed attorney is appointed on behalf of your child or over whom the person you're seeking guardianship over, that attorney would typically come to your house. They would try and interview you within the home, note the environment. Note the uh, dynamics between you. They would try and interview you as the parents. They would try and interview um, the individual over whom you're seeking guardianship, potentially any other siblings in the home, and the doctors um, who've signed off on those certifications. The court-appointed attorney can also now conduct interviews by phone and by video. And again, that's just today. So this is not the normal standard. At some point, I would imagine it's going to revert back. Importantly, though, another relaxed rule is that right now, as far as I'm aware, all surrogate offices remain closed. So when Tina had talked about qualification before or qualifying, that has to be done before the surrogate. Well, how do you qualify if the surrogate's offices are closed? Typically, they're, you're qualifying by mail, all right? So after the judgment is provided to us, we forward to the clients. The clients are then gonna either reach out to the surrogate or the surrogate will reach out to them and provide the paperwork that they need to print off, complete, mail in with a check. Um, but because the surrogate offices are closed and some counties are taking a lot longer to qualify than others, one of the relaxed rules is that judgments of incapacity and that judgment is what the judge is going to sign on the day of the hearing, that can specifically authorize the guardian to act immediately if qualification can't be done right now due to surrogate offices being closed. And the last point I just wanted to make is also, um, Tina had stressed that the 30-day window, at least from the first examination, is extremely important. This rule is also a little bit relaxed right now because again, they understand with everything going on. Um, but again, you know, the normal rule is 30 days from the first examination until all the documents are filed. So good practice would be to try to aim to achieve that. Just keep in mind that if that can happen, it's not the end of the world. We can work with that. So I'm gonna cover a couple of things that happen once you become a guardian, right? So now you're a guardian of the person, uh, but what about some of these other rights that that person has? And let's talk about like maybe voting or marriage or you know the privilege of driving. Like what happens now that they're under guardianship? And uh, you know, guardianship does not take away a person's fundamental right to marry. You know, the guardian would still make the, the decision on their behalf, but it doesn't take away that fundamental right. Um, also with driving, it doesn't take away the, the privilege to get a driving li driver's license. Now, um, it can, you know, the court can make a very specific finding that the person, um, you know, shouldn't be driving and will go ahead and limit that person's uh, privilege. But just by having a guardianship in place with the um, judgment of incapacity does not uh, take that away from the person. Voting, very similar. Um, the New Jersey Constitution was amended in 2007 to clarify this issue of the right to vote. And so only a person who has been determined by a court to lack the capacity to understand the act of voting can be deprived of that right to vote. So what does that mean? Is that the court, when they make that final judgment determination, uh, saying the person needs uh, a guardian, saying that you know, they can't make the legal, medical, financial decisions, they also have to make a very specific finding that that person 
specifically lacks the capacity to understand that act of voting. If they don't do that, that person still retains the right to vote. And so this is, so without that, uh, the full guardianship alone does not remove that. And so it's very important. I know a lot of times uh, people are concerned that they don't want to take these decisions away from their son or daughter. They want their son or daughter to be able to, you know, again, we're very proud of what our children do, what they can accomplish. Um, and we want them to be able to make decisions in their life. Uh, and there are some areas that they still retain that decision-making control. Um, one of the other things that you know, I just want to touch on is like medical decision-making. Like you're the guardian, you're making medical decisions for them. But when you're stepping and making those decisions, you still need to take into account their own preferences. Um, if they have made them and can make them. Obviously, if they don't understand the risks and the benefits of the treatment, then you need to consider, you know, what's in their best interest and, you know, the treatment and the prognosis. But when you're making those decisions, it's, it's important to uh, take into account the person's preferences. Uh, Jared, I didn't know if you had anything to add on that before I moved on to the uh, disability in the workplace and higher education. I think you hit the nail on the head with okay. that one. <laughs> Got it. All right. So the other thing is, another question we, we sometimes get is, I'm the guardian of somebody, and, uh, you know, do they need to disclose their disability in the workplace? Do they need to tell their employer? And, you know, no, they don't. The Americans with Disabilities Act says they don't have to disclose their disability. However, if their disability is going to impact, uh, you know, their ability to do their job, and they need to have an accommodation for their job, then in that case, they do need to make a disclosure, right? So that disclosure is necessary for them to work with the employer in order to get the accommodation that's needed. And the other thing is if their disability does impact their safety, the safety of others in the workplace, that's something that definitely would need to be um, uh, disclosed. The other question is, is you know, if they, um, you know, if they decide to go on to college, um, if they're taking classes even at a community college, you're in higher education. Do you need to disclose the disability at higher, in higher education? Um, same thing, you know, the ADA would protect students, um, you know, regarding the information regarding their disability and from being discriminated against. But if they need a reasonable accommodation, that's when they would be disclosing that information. And most uh, universities have a very specific office or a point contact who they would work with on campus to say, uh, hey, you know, my son or daughter's attending and this is their disability. These are the accommodations they know. And what they do is they maintain all that uh, confidential information and then share as needed with whether it's the professors or um, you know, whoever else is, is working with uh, your son or daughter. But, you know, there's no obligation to, for, to uh, disclose the disability in either of those contexts. So that's, um, you know, so if you are the guardian. The other piece um, just, you know, thought about is if you are the guardian, the other thing is you have annual reporting requirements that come along with being the guardian. And so that means making sure that you file a report every year with uh, the surrogate's office, both about the person's person and also the property if you're the guardian of both. When uh, we prepare all the information, uh, we talk with clients about that so they understand, but they also, we give them the, there's a guardianship video to watch online and we give them the, the link to the video and that goes into more detail as to what they, they need to do um, every year for that. So I don't know if we want to turn to, if we have any questions coming in or We don't have any questions in the chat feature as of right now, um, but please, everyone, feel free. If there are any questions that you think of, you can just put them in here. Actually, I, I did get two over to me. Hold on a second. Oh, to you directly? Yeah. Hang on. Here. I don't know how I can get that over here. Okay, so the question was, is, can you clarify the requirement for information from the two doctors for the guardianship? If one's a neurologist, does the other have to be an MD or could it be a therapist? Um, so no, they, they don't have to be, um, uh, uh, you know, they have to be either an MD, a DO, uh, so they need to be a doctor, but it could be uh, two pediatricians, it could be a neurologist, it could be, you know, a family care physician. Uh, as long as they are a medical doctor, they're okay to fill out the, uh, that paperwork for the, 
the guardianship. And if I can yep. just add something to that yep. real quickly, it can also be two doctors from the same practice. So if you don't have, let's say, a neurologist, you know, and your child has seen two different pediatricians growing up, as long as they, as long as both doctors both examine the individual, regardless of whether they're in the same practice, both of those would be acceptable certifications. Okay. Somebody asked also, can parents and a sibling be guardians to the same adult son with a disability? So the answer to that is absolutely. You know, we represent, um, you know, many, for instance, uh, parents will, will petition the court as co-guardians. So I think the question is really boiling down to can you have more than one guardian, which the answer to is certainly. Um, and also we see it in practice where, you know, let's say there's two parents who initially petition the court for co-guardianship. They're serving as co-guardians. You know, God forbid something happens to one parent or one parent starts to age and maybe is incapable or will soon be incapable of uh, fulfilling his or her duties as a guardian. You know, it's not uncommon for us to then petition the court uh, to have an additional co-guardian on, which is oftentimes, you know, if there's another adult child of, um, within the family who wants to be added on, it, that really is a good practice because if anything were to happen to the sole guardian or the, the last remaining initial guardian, if you will, there's someone else added on to ensure a continuity of care. Um, so the long-winded answer to your question is yes, you can certainly have co-guardians. So I had another question that came in is what is the order to relax for and what exactly does that mean? And so basically, you know, when we got shut down, everybody got shut down in the state of New Jersey, we, uh, we couldn't do anything. So we, we obviously we couldn't go anywhere. Uh, and, you know, offices were closed, businesses were closed. And uh, there were a lot of requirements in the court. The courts have very specific rules about what has to get done in order to have this application prepared for guardianship. And it became impossible to do it. So the court stepped in and they, they, they uh, issued this order across the board that said, okay, you know, social distancing is in place and therefore instead of having to go out and meet in person with the family and meet in person with um, the proposed guardian, we're going to relax that requirement. Uh, we're going to relax the requirement of having an in-person uh, physician evaluation. Instead, you can do that by telemedicine. Um, and so that's what those were relaxed for. And then it also became a little bit more difficult. Everything you know, everybody was kind of uh, learning how to adjust to working remotely, learning how to do all these Zoom things and uh, stuff from home. Um, and so that kind of put things a little bit delayed. And so having that 30 day window, you know, you might not have been able to time everything uh, correctly. So it, it was meant to make it easier and keep the guardianship process moving forward despite what's happening in the outside. And I will, I, you know, as, as much as you know, sometimes courts are difficult and we don't like the judges or the decisions, I will commend the, the courts throughout New Jersey for the guardianship process. I think during the whole shutdown, um, they've moved everything forward on a pretty close to normal schedule as we were beforehand, at least in my experience with my cases. And that's been really great for our families to be able to you know, make sure that they, they have a guardian in place when it's needed. All right, so I'm gonna ask one that's got three parts to it. So the first part is, are there any adverse impacts to higher slash college education avenues in case we apply for guardianship? Is, is there any adverse impacts with the higher education slash college education avenues in case we apply for guardianship? Like does the guardianship impact those? <laughs> It doesn't, it, you know, it, it, the only thing it does is it gives you the decision-making authority instead of your son or your daughter, um, you know, there, but outside of that, uh, it doesn't, you know, like when you are, when your child turns 18, you know, even if they are maybe still in school and they're continuing on staying till 21, once, once they turn 18, the school can no longer talk to the parent um, and, you know, fold them into those decisions. You know, being the guardian, uh, it allows you again to continue to get that information and to make sure that those decisions are, um, you know, the right ones, but it doesn't impact in terms of like them being admitted into school or um, none of that is impacted by them having a guardian in place. And actually they, they can't be discriminated against for that either. Can full guardianship be reversed to where all the rights return to the individual? Yes, yes. Um, I mean, you do have to go back to court, but it can be. Um, you know, so in, in that regard, 
um, yeah, if, if somebody's uh, condition improved, uh, you would then petition the court and say, hey, their condition improved, they're, they're no longer in need of a guardian, uh, you know. Yeah. Um, is there any adverse impact to in an individual getting full employment in case I apply for full guardianship for the individual? So the impact, uh, you mean, uh, for them to be able to work or, or get a job, I mean, the, the impact is going to be if they're not able to make um, those decisions and manage their own affairs, you know, when, when somebody's referring to full employment, um, you know, if they're able to uh, have employment at that level, you know, are, are they able to manage their affairs? Are they able to handle and make those decisions? Um, but outside of that, you know, the guardianship doesn't impact uh, a person's uh, decision for employment. It, 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 the two of them don't have anything to, to really, you know, uh, they don't affect each other in that, in that regard. I don't know, Jared, if you want to add anything to that piece. No, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, keep in mind that the individual over whom uh, is now under guardianship doesn't lose all their rights. It's not like they can't make any decisions. Right. So, I mean, they, they don't have capacity. So if we're talking about, you know, entering into a contract, they can't do that because they don't have the mental capacity. But what we're saying is that the individual continues to make decisions. However, the whoever is named as guardian really gets the superseding decision if it comes down to that. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, OK. Is it accurate that it is very difficult to undo a guardianship? I. I would tell you that it's not any more difficult to undo the guardianship than it is to institute the guardianship, but you're going to have to demonstrate to the court why the guardianship is no longer proper. And frankly, looking at it from a practical side of things, I think courts appreciate when you make that application because you don't know, you no longer have a guardian who has a power, so to speak, that they don't necessarily need, right? So if you can demonstrate that, look, you know, my child, let's say, you know, had a disability growing up when he turned 18. You know, now he or she is 35 years old. They are much more suitable and capable and they're able to make their own decisions. We don't need to have this guardianship in place. I think courts look very favorably upon that. Yeah, Jared, I would, I would agree completely with that. I mean, the court, and that's why the options are even in place to have the plenary guardianship, the full guardianship, and the limited guardianship, because the court only wants to have a guardianship in place for what is exactly necessary, right? And so if that means only for this limited area of the person's life, that's all they want to do. Uh, they don't want to, to, to control any more than they, they have to. So. Can driving trip privileges be taken away because the individual is under full guardianship? So not, not just, not by the guardianship alone, right? Uh, but the court can make a finding, and, and more often than not, we see this with uh, somebody who's elderly uh, that going, you know, for, for a guardianship because they've had capacity, they have the driving privilege, um, and then now they, maybe they have dementia or whatever, and then now you, they need a guardian in place, and they already have that privilege. More often than not, someone who, um, needs a guardian uh, turning 18 and transitioning into that, uh, doesn't, have the doesn't have the capacity um, you know, for that, but might also not be able to even pass the written test or even pass the road test to get a driver's license. Um, and so that's a different analysis than taking it away. Um, but if you wanted to restrict that, you would have to ask for that specifically because that's not automatically taken, you know, taken away from somebody. And then the court would have to specifically put that in the order that the driving privileges are revoked. Um, one that I, I think you touched on a little bit um, already was, but I think somebody wants some confirmation. Can we ask the judge if our child can keep the right to be able to vote? So, you're, even under a full guardianship, they're not going to net. They're not going to lose the right to vote unless it's specifically outlined in the judgment that the that the judge is going to sign that he or she loses the right to vote. So by default, that language is not in the guardianship judgment. Or if you're currently serving as a guardian, take a look at the judgment. Unless it's specifically in there, the individual is going to retain the right to vote. It's one of those fundamental rights. In your will, can you appoint a new guardian in case something happens to you? Will they have to go through this process also? Yes. Yes. All right. So first of all, you definitely want to think about if you are a guardian for somebody else, you definitely want to be thinking about your estate plan, not just in your will, um, 
for, for that, but also any other documents. But in, um, yes, yeah, so the court, it's the court that gives the other person or even you the authority to act as the guardian, right? So if you're, if you've passed away, um, then you, you know, you're, you're naming the person you want to be your successor, they would still need to go to the court and ask for uh, permission and ask for the court to uh, grant that and, and give them the authority to act as that person's guardian. Uh, just a couple other points, you know, thinking about, you know, your successor and, you know, decision making for you when you're a guardian is one thing people do is as they age and they will sometimes add on, uh, maybe if they have another child, who's you know, now an adult in their mid thirties and they wanna add them on as a co-guardian while they're still alive. What that does is that's very important is um, if, you wait to, if you wait till you pass away, then you might have a gap in time between when you've passed away and you're the guardian and when the new guardian is, is appointed, right? So that leaves that person without anybody you know, making decisions on their behalf. By adding on a co-guardian while you're still alive, if something should happen to you, you can now fold it in another, first of all, you fold it in another person in on the process. So they become familiar what to do, they're not in the dark, but now you don't have that gap. And that's very, very important for the, the continuity of care for someone. So that way there's no, no breaks in that. And the other piece, and I know tomorrow there's a presentation specifically on adult on estate planning, but you know, also in your uh, power of attorney document, your medical directive document, while you're still alive, those documents are in place. But if you have decisions, uh, the decision making authority as a guardian, you're able to designate um, that to somebody else in those in those situations. So if you you know you're in a coma and you can't make medical decisions for yourself. And maybe you need to also make a medical decision for your child that's under guardianship. How do you do that? Well, there's documents in place that can kind of help fill that gap and kind of, again, make sure that there's a continuity of care. Okay, can you talk about supported decision-making? I don't know if that's just gonna lead us into our next segment um, or what have you, but. Supported decision. Somebody uh, said, can you talk about supported decision-making? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, really, and Ellen uh, Nalvin had covered this kind of in depth earlier, but really, you know, that's something, you know, where, let's say, Plan New Jersey, you know, of whom she's the executive director over, you know, they really uh, provide supported decision making. And again, it's really relating to the types of decision making you're making on behalf of the individual. So again, you're not supposed to necessarily replace your wishes for the individuals. You're supposed to give them, you know, their, uh, you're supposed to give deference to their preferences. You're supposed to encourage them to make as many decisions as possible. You're supposed to provide supported decision-making for which they're making decisions and not necessarily substitute your decision or your best interest for them. Now, oftentimes, if they're gonna make a decision that's you know, either harmful to them or harmful to others, you know, you're gonna be able to make a decision that supersedes uh, the individuals, but you're supposed to support his or her decision-making. Um, if there is a non-custodial parent for a 19-year-old BD child, do they need to be notified of the guardianship? Yes. Um, so definitely the, the non-custodial parent would be notified. Um, and, you know, depending on the situation, you know, uh, that'll depend on, you know, a lot of times, sorry, let me back up a second. A lot of times we have divorced parents who are co-parenting um, when their child turns 18, uh, they, you know, they'll put in an application for them to be co-guardians, basically continue the co-parenting concept, but uh, on the guardian, in the guardianship world and with guardianship decision-making um, in that regard, but, but again, working together with each other. Um, sometimes you have a very uh, hostile or difficult uh, end of your relationship, or maybe it's not the best situation for your child. Um, and sometimes one parent will uh, want to be the guardian uh, solely. If the other parent will consent to that, that's the easiest way to do it is contact them, reach out, see if they'll consent. Um, and, uh, you know, then they can just say, yeah, I'm okay with this decision. If not, uh, then they would need to be served with a copy of the complaint and all the formal pleadings. Uh, so they did have notice of it. And then they would have the right to, again, object to anything or object to the person who's being proposed as the guardian for that. Um, you know, under law, you know, just generally, the two best people, you know, in theory are the parents. So whether they're the non-custodial parent or the custodial parent, the law is still going to look to them first in that. So definitely in that regard. And then same thing if there's other children. Other, other children, if they're adults, also have to receive notice 
of that. And, and that's important as well. Okay, you mentioned filing um, or filling out a yearly report at the surrogate's office. I'm my daughter's guardian and didn't know about this requirement. How do I do this? Well, the first thing I would tell you is to take a look at the guard, take a look at the judgment, because depending on when you obtained um, the guardianship, at least as far as the annual report of well-being, that wasn't always a requirement. So take a look at the guardianship judgment. You may not be required to file that. If you are required to file that, I'd recommend you simply go online, go to, you know, run a Google search and type in NJ annual report of well-being. It'll pop right up. It's a pretty simple two-page PDF form. Um, you know, the individual has to be seen by the doctor. You know, they want to make sure that the individual's condition isn't uh, changing significantly. They basically want a checks and balance, however much they can, you know, to ensure that the guardian isn't being derelict in their duties. It's a good checks and balance. The other thing is you want to make sure you file that report um, because if you do ever want to transfer the guardianship out of the state or if you want to close the guardianship out, that is going to be something that the court wants to have on record. Um, the other thing is that if you don't file it, and some counties enforce it more than others, you know, nothing may happen for a while. But at some point in time, you're going to get a letter. And if you do nothing, you're going to get another letter. And at some point after so many letters, the judge is going to call you in. You know, and part of your job as a guardian, as a fiduciary, you know, you, you're, you're a servant of the court, right? So you know, it's, a, it's a small responsibility. Set your calendar about 11 months out. It's due on the anniversary of your appointment as guardian every year. Set a reminder and just get it done. You know, it, it's good practice. I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that, Tina. Uh, the only thing is I, I have had a couple that, uh, you know, it wasn't under the original guardianship um, in the original guardianship order because they were much older. And I did have some even more recently that the parents just simply forgot and it was in a county that, uh, you know, doesn't really enforce it. And it was a simple phone call to the surrogate office for them, just kind of coordinated what they needed to do um, just to get current on everything. And, um, you know, obviously the, the courts are very happy if you've, if you've made a mistake and you contact them and say, hey, I'm going to fix this. Uh, they're very happy that you're fixing it and that you're doing the right thing. And so that, you know, certainly if, if you were obligated to do so and you didn't, just go ahead, let's figure out what you need to do and take care of it. Uh, if you didn't have to under, under uh, the previous order, then it's something that you might not have to do, but you may in the future. So. And, and just one last thing about that, you know, I, I've seen clients where they obtain the guardianship, let's say, you know, 20 years ago, and it was not necessarily a requirement. If you go back and petition the court to add on a co-guardian, just be prepared. If you go through the guardianship process now, it will likely now be a requirement moving forward. Right. Okay. Is there a limited number of co-guardians? Say, can three people be co-guardians at the same time? No, there's there's not a, a number, and actually, the you know we've seen three. We, I've seen three in a couple different scenarios. Uh, number one, a lot of times when the parents are again aging and they want to add on one of their other their children to, or you know another adult family member to serve with them. That you know that's where I've seen three. I've also seen three when I've had uh, divorced parents and maybe they have another adult child who they have on there to serve as the co the tiebreaker. You know, if there's any you know decisions they can't agree on. Um, so there, there have been three uh, in a variety of, of situations. Certainly wouldn't do more than that. The, the challenge isn't so much with the court allowing it. The, the challenge becomes with, I think, practically administering things as a guardian, right? So then that means the three of you have to be on board with everything. The three of you might have to, um, you know, contact, uh, you know, if, if they're, you're changing a placement or, you know, they're, they're moving somewhere or if there's, you know, something happening um, and there's like medical, you know, decision making needed, you know, all three of you have to be on board. So that's where um, sometimes it becomes challenging. And it also depends on the language of the order. Most uh, guardianship judgments will use language in there that says you all have to basically have to act, you know, on the same page and, and act together. Uh, with regard to maybe opening up an ABLE account, we need to get special language in there that says either guardian could act. So there's three of you, then only one of you can act for that ABLE account. Um, so it's special language we have to get in, in that order saying that. So anything else on that, Jared? No, I, I completely agree. I think that, you know, at least from the onset, if there aren't special circumstances, I think two is more appropriate. You can always add a third one on later on. And it's a little bit of a quicker process because, you know, uh, the individual, the ward has already been adjudicated as incapacitated. So you don't need the doctor's certifications. You know, you really, the court just needs to make sure that the application is proper. But like Tina had said, the more 
Uh, cooks in the kitchen sometimes can <laughs> cause a problem, um, especially if everyone has to act jointly together and is on the same page. So, you know, especially if it's parents, unless there's unusual circumstances, you know, typically I think two is a good number, three, uh, possibly, I, I would not go above three. This one's probably going to go more towards you, Jared. Um, the, are, are there formal agreements and laws for supported decision making versus informal arrangements? So it's an interesting question. Um, I would tell you that usually it is informally done um, because at the end of the day, the guardian is going to have the ability, that's the whole purpose of guardianship is we're saying that the individual lacks the capacity to make decisions, um, especially affecting his or her well-being. Um, you know, so as far as supported decision-making goes, um, you may be able to you know, have something in place, but at the end of the day, the guardian's decision is ultimately going to control just add on that you know if you're making medical decisions for somebody else right and and making sure that again you have to take the incapacitated person's preferences in mind when you're when you're making those decisions um if you're making medical decisions you're going to be communicating with the doctor you know you're going to be communicating with medical professionals and if they feel like you're overriding that person's decisions and their preferences you know they could always intervene and, and you know you know kind of push back on your authority for that so you know while it's a little bit more informal when you're when you're making decisions there's also you know you, you are sometimes making these decisions to third parties um, she followed up and said this is meant to be outside of guardianship as an alternative to guardianship for the supported decision making Okay. So, you know, again, the guardianship is binding. It's established by a court. I mean, what you're really asking for is, you know, can we put together a plan that everyone's going to be in agreement to act on behalf of someone? Sure, you could certainly put that, you know, in place, but it's, it's not as concrete as, you know, a procedure um, such as guardianship, which is, you know, established by court and by law, um, where you actually have, you know, an order from the court saying you are the guardian, you get to act on behalf of someone. So, it's, a, it's better than nothing, don't get me wrong, um, you know, but I think if the individual really isn't able to manage his or her own affairs or his or herself, you know, guardianship may be the appropriate place to start. Um, but again, reach out to the doctor, see what the doctors think, um, and that should hopefully point you in the right direction. I think that's all the questions I have. I think we got to all of them. All right. Okay. Yeah, if there's anything else, please feel free to put it in the chat. But I don't see anything else coming in. No, I think we're a oh, wonderful session, someone says. So I think I think we're wrapping up. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, that will end our session then, unless Jared and Tina has anything else to add to that. Um, we appreciate everybody um, registering for this session. Please um, pop in for our keynote tonight. Um, it's supposed to be a real treat. I think we're all really excited for it. Um, and thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Take care, everyone. Good night. Thank you for watching this Encore presentation from the Fall 2020 Hinkle, Pryor & Fisher Parent Empowerment Conference. With 24 other presentations to view, there is plenty of additional information to help you become empowered. As a reminder, the information contained in this video is not a substitute for individual legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. Copyright 2020 Hinkle, Pryor & Fisher PC Attorneys at Law all rights reserved.